Hey, this is Bruce, AKA Frugal Tech, and welcome to my first video dealing with network security. This is Network Security 101, and the topic today is social engineering. But before I get started, just a few things I'd like to mention to you. And one, I've been in the network security business for going on 10 years, uh, next June as a matter of fact. And I have clients all over the USA, including some Fortune 500 companies, and also some very small little companies as well. And I deal with businesses and provide uh, network security software tools to help them maintain a secure system. So a lot of my work involves talking to uh, CIOs and also sysadmins at these companies about what the products do and the kind of issues they're facing and the challenges. Now, the purpose of these videos is not to sell you the products that I sell, okay? So that's not the purpose. The purpose really is to share with you some of the things I learned. And so when I sat down, I said, okay, what am I going to talk about with my first video? The very first one, Could it, would it be some type of you know, you know, hardware, like a unithi unified threat management tool? Uh, would I talk about viruses, malware, Trojans, rootkits, key loggers? No. You know what I think is important? And that is that the bad guys have, you know, they know that companies and people are employing a lot of these tools on their networks all the time. They've looked for a new and creative way to bypass this stuff. In other words, all the security measures that you take up front, your investment in hardware and software and policies, are for naught if the bad guys have found out a way to completely and totally circumvent those systems. And the tool of choice today is known as social engineering. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about specifically. In today's video, I'm going to cover three types of social engineering experiments that happen all the time. And the first I'm going to talk about is using the phone. Now, many of us are probably familiar with these Microsoft tech support scammers that call on the phone. But you know what? This actually is quite effective, especially the way it's done by you know, the really good scammers and done on businesses. A lot of people get a call from someone very friendly saying, yeah, I'm with the Microsoft support department. Understand you're having a problem with your computer. Now, if you call and talk to enough people, eventually you will get somebody on the phone that is indeed having a problem with their computer. At that point, they will allow the bad guy to take remote control of their computer and begin to install tools that will let them uh, use that as a command and control center for them. Uh, this is uh, typically how it's done on the phone. Other ways it's done on the phone is by using uh, social media sites such as LinkedIn, discovering who uh, the sysadmin is or who the CIO is, president of the company, whatever, calling somebody there at the business and getting their username and password. Uh, and because why? Because the employee obviously wants to do their job. They don't want to make anybody angry. And uh, human psychology, you see, that's what social engineering is really about, is human psychology. Using our need to say yes to uh, respond to a reasonable request. That's how humans are hardwired, and that's what we do. So using social media tools, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc., uh, and the telephone, you can go a long, long way, especially in a company with a lot of people who aren't particularly computer savvy. The second type of social engineering happens to be a physical one. Now, let me give you a real life example. A enterprising person managed to get a Cisco shirt, right? The polo shirt, Cisco on it. And he also had a satchel full of uh, USB thumb drives with goodies to hand out to the employees at the company. Now, the door to the company he targeted uh, had an access card. He just simply stood by the door and waited till somebody was coming out and said, would you mind holding the door for me? My hands are full. And of course, yes, go on in. Then because he knew the name of the sysadmin, walked up to the secretary, the gatekeeper, 
and said, I just got an emergency phone call. It's supposed to be down here right away. There's a big problem back in the uh, server room. I need to get right back there. She buzzed him right on through, no questions asked. And instead of going to the server room, he went around to various cubicles, passing out the free USB thumb drives, and then left. The employees plugged him into the computer where the endpoints weren't properly secured and a viral infection took over the network. This really happened not that long ago. So I wanted to share that with you. Getting physical access to the servers, getting physical access to the PCs and employees, there you go. You could also walk up to a cubicle and say, uh, you know, that uh, the CIO mentioned his name, the sysadmin, uh, ask him down, check something out of the computer. Oh, doggone it, I forgot to bring your username and password. You have it handy. Sure, absolutely. Because, you know, you got the badge. I think this fella even had a badge with his picture on it and a fake company name. Sure, absolutely. That's what people do. They don't understand that they're being psychologically manipulated into handing out their passwords, usernames, and that kind of thing. So this is a form of social engineering. It's using psychology to get people to say yes, because intrinsically that's what we want to do. We want to help people, and the bad guys know this. Now, the third example of social engineering involves social media websites. If you can gain access to a person's Facebook account, for example, a common scam is to pose as somebody else on Facebook, claim that you're uh, stranded somewhere and you've been robbed. You need $500, $1,000 to get back home. Well, because you've... Uh, You've been hacked, your Facebook account's been hacked, for example. Your friends will see that, and, and somebody may very well say, oh my goodness, my friend needs help, and they'll wire them the money to uh, this location where the bad guy will pick up the cash from Western Union or whatever. That is a form of social engineering. Another way that you see much more of, that's going to be through phishing scams, particular, particularly uh of scams that involve, say, eBay, PayPal, and others. You know, if you get a, if a unsuspecting or unknowledgeable worker gets an email at work, this from uh, let's say eBay saying, "Hey, you just got a uh, you know a bad review or whatever on eBay. You need to log in and, and look at this." Uh, they'll do it, not realizing that link actually takes them to another site. And, and I get this one all the time from PayPal, telling my account has been limited until I re-verify my credentials with the link. And it looks like it came from PayPal, even though the link takes you somewhere else. That is known as phishing. And it works. It still is effective, even though uh, a lot of uh, software will, you know, flag it as spam. Some people will still do it because they're scared. It looks real. You know, we don't want a bad review on eBay or whatever. Uh, credit card companies, banks, etc asking to verify your credentials. And this is all a form of using circumventing. This is a technique used to circumvent all the security tools, products, the hardware, the regulations, the policies of the sysadmin of the company in order to get around this. You know, it's the employees who represent the greatest danger to a computer network in a business, in a company. It happens all the time. If you don't think that uh, industrial espionage isn't still a thing, guess again, all the time. Key people walk out with uh, information they've downloaded onto a USB thumb drive, uh, presentations, sales literature, product plans, client lists. That's a form of industrial espionage, and it costs companies a lot of money. You know, that's the thing about, about a business network is that these companies have so much to lose. Some of them have to comply with government regulations such as HIPAA, PCI DSS, and others. Uh, and if they're not properly secured, if an employee walks out with this information, they're at very, very real risk. A data breach can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Target themselves has not fully recovered from the last data breach. There's a lot of people afraid to shop there because of their failed security policies at Target. So that's the purpose of the video, is to take a little piece uh, of network security, talk about it, what can be done, and so forth. And I haven't answered that question in this video. What can be done about social engineering? Well, the answer is, it's, it is tough. I won't, I won't lie to you. It's, it's tough. But what can be done is education. And education begins by teaching your employees, your family, your friends, that people online 
who claim they're one person may not necessarily be that person. People aren't always who they say they are on the other end of the phone. Or that person, you're, even your meeting in person, may not actually been hired by the company to be there. So that's the thing, to be a bit skeptical about who you're dealing with. That's very, very important. And a great first step is to let people know what social engineering is. That there's people deliberately trying to get uh, you to, uh, to hack Facebook accounts. There's people trying to pose as working in the IT department to help them with their computers. There's people trying to give them USB thumb drives that may have viruses and trojans on it that are not safe to accept. It begins with that type of education. Educating your user is so very, very important in network security. And that's it uh, in this first installment of Network Security 101. Social engineering is a huge problem and it's a way to circumvent a significant investment in network security for your business or even your home network. Bruce Naylor, till the next one.